Well, good morning, everyone. John here with an update on the World Vision Global 6K Run Walk. Uh, we talked a little bit about this last week as an opportunity for us to do something to impact the world from right where we are right now. The World Vision Global 6K Virtual Run Walk is taking place on May 16th. And it's a virtual event, which means that there won't be, we won't be able to gather together for this event, but instead we're able to do it right in our own neighborhoods, in our own backyards, in a park or on a path near wherever it is that we live. And uh, so we can be a part of that and a part of bringing clean water to communities like this one. In the developing world, 1,000 children die every day from dirty and or diseased water. That's 1,000 kids every single day. And so for communities like Kamama, that's part of how this has changed their community so dramatically. We see statistics like how many kids get to go to school now because of clean water. Prior to their community having clean water, on average about 200 kids were in school each day. Now there's upwards of 500 kids in school each and every day. Before their community had clean water right within uh, its local area, kids like Kamama as young as five years old would walk an average of six kilometers every day for clean water. And on their journey to get clean water, they encounter uh, wild animals and even worse, people who intend to do them harm. I can't imagine sending our kids to the gas station on their own, on a paved path let alone sending someone as young as five years old to get clean water for our survival. And yet that's what parents are faced with each and every day in communities like Kamamas. And so we wanna invite you this weekend to take another step to be ready for the Global 6K. And so you can text Five Oaks Impact to 555-888 and that will generate a link for you to follow once you're done with our service this morning and you can register you and your family for the Global 6K. Every registration provides clean water for someone like Kamama for life. And so take a moment after you're done with the service this morning to, uh, to register your family and to get the link that you need to do that. Go ahead and text 5 Oaks Impact to 555-888 right now.
Welcome everyone to Five Oaks at Home. My name is John Eiselt and I serve as our family and discipleship pastor. We're glad that you are joining us again here this weekend. And we want to let you know that we are praying for you and for your family each and every day throughout each and every week. And we want to be able to do that as specifically as we can. So you can go to our website at fiveoaks.church and click on the prayer tab near the top of the page. And that will open a form that you can fill out with your specific prayer requests. And once you're done with that, you hit submit and it goes straight to our prayer team. And then they're able to pray for your prayer requests specifically. Over the course of the last few weeks, we've talked a lot about giving and why it's important for our community and more so why it's important for us individually as we walk with God during this season. And so I want to bring you a, an exciting update. And that update is that our, our giving has held steady during this time. And so we're celebrating that and uh, we're grateful for your generosity and for your faithfulness to God and your commitment to our Five Oaks community. And so as we move into the coming weeks, we encourage you to continue to trust God. And uh, we're excited to get to do so and to experience that as a community. If you still haven't had a chance to set up your online giving, you can do that by going to our website, click, at the, click on the Give tab near the top of the page, and that will take you in uh, to another spot on the website that'll give you an option to either give a one-time gift or to set up a recurring gift. If you're not comfortable putting your financial information online, we totally understand that, and uh, we wanna help you to continue to be able to give during this season. You can call the church office and uh, we can give you some instructions on how you can mail in your gifts instead of putting them online. We've also heard a lot from each of you how connected you feel to your church community right now. And uh, we recognize that as well. And that has a lot of irony to it because we obviously aren't meeting physically but uh, we, we feel the same. We feel connected as a community during this time and even closer to each other than, than we have before. And we wanna help you to continue to stay connected to each other. And one of the ways we wanna help you to do that is by being able to help one another. And so you'll see on our website, we have two links that you can click on. One of those links says, I need help. And one says, I can help. And so whichever link applies best to you, we wanna invite you to go to the website, click on that link and spend a few minutes telling us about how you might need some help or how you might be able to help. It's hard for all of us to ask for help when we need it, but this is one of the incredible powers of being a part of a church community. We get to be a part of helping one another, both in the good times and in the hard times. And, and sometimes it's through the hard times where we see God show up the most. And sometimes God shows up through the people that we're walking through life with. So go ahead and spend some time this weekend telling us how you need some help or telling us how you can help. And we'll get your needs matched up with those who can help. And um, it's a way that we can celebrate our church community. I hope you have a great weekend here this weekend. I'm going to send it over to Tom and Kelsey in South St. Paul as we begin our worship. Have a great weekend, everybody. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome again to the Vang House. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm the worship pastor at Five Oaks, and this is Kelsey. Hey, guys. Um, and uh, we're so glad to have you in our house this morning. As we prepare to worship God this morning, as always, we're going to call one another to worship. So wherever you are, um, you can stand or you can sit. But um, let's uh, go into the Word together as we read the Scripture. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. Shine your glory over all the earth. Let's sing this together. One, two, three, four. Waited for this day, we gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing. Open. Presence in this place, your glory on our face. 
into the sky Descending like a cloud You're standing with us now Lord, unveil our eyes You're the reason we're here Yes, you are, Lord You're the reason we're singing Open up the heavens We want to see you Open up the floodgates Almighty river Flowing from your heart God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength in honor and glory and praise.
Five Oaks family, we're glad you're tuned in with us online. We're able to connect in this way. Um, Jonathan Small Group's pastor, and we're in our part of our service where we're taking time to pray. Uh, there's no more important time than now to be praying, and we'd be praying in some particular ways. Uh, the main reason why we're praying is so that God's redemptive purpose and process can move in and through the people of our world, our country, our city, and our church. Uh, but also we're praying because we want to see how God would like to use us as a part of that. And we are God's family. And that is such a blessing. And because we're God's family, God has some family values, some kingdom values. And we look to that identity we have in Him only because He's given it to us freely, that we get to live out of that identity, and we get to do that in and through prayer and guidance by the Holy Spirit. And so I want to invite us to pray right now with whoever you're with, and we're going to pray for the three specific things we've been doing the last number of weeks, our city and country, our world, and our church. So... Let's pray right now for our city and our country. Okay, now let's pray for our world.
And now let's pray for our church. And let us pray together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey, Five Oaks family and friends uh, who are joining us for worship today online. I'm down here in the lower level of my home again, in the corner office that I have at my stand-up desk. I want to, before I I get into the sermon, I just want to say that every day around 5.05, and that can vary uh, a lot of times, uh, but and it's not every day, it's Monday through Friday, I go on Facebook Live and I uh, do a prayer, I pray a prayer, and invite a bunch of people to join me in praying that prayer. And I'd love for you to join me. If you're not doing that, you can go over to our uh, Five Oaks Church Facebook page, and you can find a link to that there. And love for you to join me. I love especially the interaction afterwards as as you send comments and, and tell me about how this is impacting you, or tell me about how this crisis is impacting you, or about the thought, the thing we're praying about is impacting you. And so I invite you to join us for that. You can check out our Five Oaks Facebook page. So we're looking today, specifically, we're back in our series on Habakkuk. We had two weeks before Easter. We've got three weeks left in it. We're looking today at chapter 2, verses 4 through 20. We're looking at Habakkuk because Habakkuk and the people of Israel are facing an enormous crisis. Uh, In fact, uh, one that really what God says and what Habakkuk prays and says to God speaks so directly to what we're going through ourselves. So I want to invite you to turn to that right now, Habakkuk chapter 2. You may want to pause the video uh, to get everything together. We have a sermon application guide at the fiveoaks.church website at the sermon page. You can download that, and you can get your communion materials ready as well. So we'll put up a slide here in just a moment that will uh, list what you need going forward if you haven't gotten it yet, so you can pause right now. If you have been at Five Oaks uh, for very long, 
uh, you know that I'm very careful how I talk about politics, and we even have a church policy that is very careful for some very biblical reasons for how we talk about po politics, but I think I can address, without getting political, something that was said this week by the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo. And uh, so it was during one of his daily briefings, and uh, I think it's something that maybe looking back at this crisis in, our, you know, in the history books, it might be something that's brought up several times, what he said in his briefing. And this is, this is what he said. He said, the number is down, talking about the plateau in the, in the um, cases. He says, the number is down because we brought the number down. God did not do that. Fate did not do that. Destiny did not do that. A lot of pain and suffering did that. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, and I think he deserves the benefit of the doubt, and say that he was really just trying to make a point very forcefully that the people of New York need to remain vigilant in fighting the spread of the virus. Um, I don't think when he said we did it, I don't think he's saying the government. I don't think he's pointing at himself. I think he's saying, we, the people, did this. But taking God completely out of the picture is, from a biblical standpoint, it's never a good idea. And it's always a case, in one way or another, it's a case of human arrogance. And given the death toll in New York and the uncertainty that the governor himself consistently speaks about with regard to the science that they're depending on, the policies that they're pending, depending on, considering all the uncertainty that he himself speaks at about the economics and the economic impact and what the future holds and when uh, the economy will start again, given all of that, it's ironic at best, that the people of New York, that he is saying the people of New York, should take credit for what has happened and leave God completely out of the picture. But rather than point the finger at the, uh, you know, a finger at the governor of New York and say, look how bad he is, let's really ask this question because I don't, I don't think he's alone in this. I, I think, I would never say what he said, but I think sometimes I live what he said. And so, Stop for just a few moments and ask yourself this question on the slide. How am I taking God out of the picture in my actions, in my emotions, in the entire focus of my life before and during this crisis? How am I displaying human arrogance by the way that I live out my life? I think we need to ask that question of ourselves rather than pontificating on what the governor of New York... I mean, I think we need to comment on what the governor of New York said uh, and think about taking God out of the picture, certainly, but we need to ask this question as well. So in the passage today, there's 17 verses in our passage. 15 of the verses focus on the Babylonians, and it focuses on the utter destruction and devastation that they are going to bring on Israel. But two verses kind of pop out in this passage, and those two verses seem to come almost out of nowhere, and they're exactly calibrated to humble Israel, and in the humility that Israel needs to have to guide them by calling for gospel humility in their crisis. They can, what these verses say, they can humble us and guide us as well. So we're going to explore this passage by addressing a couple of questions. The first question we're going to ask is, what is gospel humility? And where do we see that in this passage? 
And the second question is, why do we need gospel humility in this crisis? And before we look at these two questions, we're going to pray together, as we did a couple of weeks ago. We're going to pray together the prayer of illumination, asking God to speak through his word. And we'll then read the passage. And instead of me reading the passage, we're going to have a special group of people read the passage for us. We're going to have medical professionals, the people that are close to or right on the front lines of this crisis. They're going to be reading uh, the passage for us. And uh, so let's pray, and we're going to begin by, uh, by praying this prayer together. It's based on Philippians chapter 2, and I want to invite you to pray out loud the underlined portions of this prayer. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, you alone are holy. You have a plan, and you are Lord over everything. Thank you for sending your Son so that we could be united with him. Thank you for your continued work in us. May we be open to the leading of your spirit as we look to your word. Move our hearts and minds to a posture of surrender and submission to you. Lead us to live our lives for your purposes and for the glory of your name, We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. See, the enemy is puffed up, and his desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest, because he is as greedy as the grave. And like death is never satisfied, he gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey, because you have plundered many nations. The peoples who are left will plunder you, for you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you, and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, and your destruction of animals will terrify you, for you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol carved by craftsmen or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life. Or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. I want to thank all of you who read that passage. These are all five ochres who are medical professionals. Uh, For most of you, if not all of you, there's no shelter in place. And so we appreciate your sacrifices Uh, on behalf of us, and uh, we just thank you for that. So the big question that we're exploring uh, today, uh, driven home by this passage, is why do we need gospel humility in this crisis? Before we answer that, uh, we need to ask this question. We need to ask, what is gospel humility? Here's why I'm talking about gospel humility from this passage 
Look at verses 4 and 5. Verse 4. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. If you look at those words that are underlined, puffed up and arrogant, we get a picture of of what's going on in this chapter. It's all connected. Pride is the issue. And what is the result of pride? Well, in their pride, the Babylonians stop at nothing to heap up glory for themselves. It's about themselves. They use people and nations for their own glory, shedding blood, destroying entire civilizations for their own glory. That's why later in this passage, God says they will receive shame and judgment instead of the glory that they seek in their arrogance. Now, the antidote to pride is humility. The antidote to self-glory is the seeking God's glory that comes through humility. But what is humility, really? I love the definition that C.S. Lewis gives. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. So it's not just putting yourself down. It's, It's not being so focused on yourself. The Babylonians are focused on themselves, and they're focused on their own glory, And in doing that, they use and abuse others for their own glory, for their own purposes. They put themselves at the center of the universe and they're willing to trample on everyone else to accomplish what they want. But we're talking today about gospel humility. Gospel means the story of God. That's what it means in scripture. It's more than the plan of salvation. It's it's the the whole story from beginning to the end. It's about the creation, our separation from God that we chose, his unfolding plan of redemption and reconciliation and salvation that's characterized, this plan is characterized by perfect justice and perfect love, and his plan to recreate everything, the new heavens and the new earth. So when I say gospel humility, it means I'm thinking less about myself and my glory, and I'm more and more making my life about God and his glory within his story, which, by the way, he plans to He's told us, Jesus tells us this, that he plans to share his glory with us, that we're going to bask in his glory. God will share his glory with us. That's a a, a very important part of this story. So what is gospel humility? Gospel humility equals going for God's glory in his story. Going for God's glory in his story. This changes everything. It changes our response and actions and emotions which leads to the second and last question that we're asking, which is, why do we need gospel humility in this crisis? Now, before I I respond to that question, I want you to notice the gospel humility in Habakkuk's response. It's a gospel humility. It's found in uh, those two verses that break the mold of the rest of the verses that were just read. Now, We're going to look at only one of those verses. Uh, You will look at the other verse if you look at the discussion questions and in your small groups, you can do that. But here's the the first verse that that breaks in and brings this this hope and this guidance and this gospel humility. It's, It's Habakkuk 2, verse 14. Here's what it says. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What is that talking about? This is a new creation picture. This is, this is looking to the day when there will be a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. Now, if the idea of God's glory is something that's just too abstract to you and you don't understand what it means, I want you to think about the celebration at the end of, of something that most of us uh, see. You know, it's the Super Bowl or it can be maybe you watch the World Cup or maybe the World Series, something, something like that, where you see this incredible celebration going on and this, all this basking in the glory of winning and the crowd is into it and they are basking in the glory of that team and they're giving trophies and they're talking about how they won and about their season and all those kinds of things. They're giving the most valuable player award. You know, all those kinds of things are going. That is, that's glory and that's glorifying. And so think of that, but now remember the fact 
that what we're talking about is that something that is only a game. We're talking about something that is a game. It feels good, yes, when your team wins. It feels good to win, but it doesn't change anything substantially in your life, unless you're a part of that team. It doesn't really change anything substantially in your life. But at the new creation, the glory that's going to be revealed at the new creation, we're talking about the final defeat of death. We're talking about the final defeat of pain, sorrow. We're talking about the wonders, the absolute wonders. I mean, think of the beauties of the heavens. I mean, it's the, the things that we're seeing with the telescopes that we have now. Think of all of that. But this is, we get to see the recreating of the heavens and the earth. The wonder of heaven coming down to earth and of God in all of his majesty coming to live among us. And that in his presence, we're told, his glory will shine so much that it will eliminate the need for the light from the sun. So think about verse 14 again. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's gospel humility. That's putting, instead of like the Babylonians and their arrogance, it's being humble and recognizing that God is God. That even the power of the Babylonians can't overcome God. So how does this kind of humility apply in this crisis? I want to suggest three ways. You'll, you'll come up with more if you think about this. First of all, if we're going for God's glory in his story, we can experience peace in uncertainty because we know the ultimate end of the story. It's a good end, and we're part of his story. A lot of us are frustrated when we form our own opinions about what should be done next in the midst of this crisis, and our politicians maybe choose to go in a little bit of a different direction than what we think are a big difference in direction. We get frustrated. We get afraid when we hear the experts freely admit how, uh, how limited their knowledge is and how uncertain even science is as it's being applied, that there's constant un uncertainty. But in the midst of that, we don't have to live in a frustrated state of being, and we don't have to live in fear, we can respond with enduring calm and we can respond with courage because we know the end of the story. Why else do we need gospel humility? Well, if we're going for God's glory in his story, we don't have to use others to seek our own glory because God will share his glory with us. We can take our eyes off of ourselves we don't have to kick and scratch to get what God will give us freely. Why do we need gospel humility in this crisis? Thirdly, if we're going for God's glory in his story, we can focus on serving God's purposes. We can focus on serving our family members. And yes, that even means serving your brothers and your sisters. We can focus on serving our neighbors and blessing our neighbors, on our fellow workers, on blessing our world in the midst of this crisis. So one of the places we can start right now is within our own homes if we're watching this with our family or waiting this thing out with our families. One of the questions we can ask ourselves is, whose glory and whose story are you seeking as demonstrated by your actions? I think if we're living with someone right now during shelter in place, I don't think there's a one of us that doesn't have something, many things that we need to confess and we need to repent of and we need to seek to pursue God's glory in a better way by the way we serve the people around us, especially our family members. We need gospel humility because it will transform our response to the crisis. It will transform the way that we take it in, but it will also transform the way that we 
we act and live in the midst of this crisis. So one last thought uh, as we prepare here for communion. Uh, the Babylonians, uh, they were arrogant. They were seeking glory for themselves. They did it by trashing entire civilizations. They used others for their glory. And God tells Habakkuk that their glory will become their shame. In Habakkuk 2, 16, it says, You will be filled with shame instead of glory. The cup, and then it skips, you know, I'll skip a few words, but it says, The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you, and disgrace will cover your glory. Shame instead of glory, disgrace will cover your glory. But the reality is that every one of us, this isn't just the Babylonians, every one of us uses people for our own glory. We deserve shame and disgrace. And that is what we would receive if not for Jesus in his incarnation and Jesus on the cross. He emptied himself of his glory, of his glory by becoming one of us, the scripture says. And he experienced shame by going to the cross. He experienced shame in the crucifixion. And he did it for us. He bore our shame by taking our sin on the cross. And that's what we remember every time we eat the bread and drink the cup. So I invite you now to, to take the bread and eat it, remembering the body of Christ broken for you. And now I invite you to take the cup, remembering the blood of Christ that was shed for you. If you have kids in the home, this would be the time to share something sweet, the honey, a taste of honey, or, and to pray that blessing over them. They'll be on the screen in just a moment. And then we'll continue our worship by responding to God together. Your name, your name is victory. 
tomb where soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days. His body there would not be Our God is Okay, everybody, as we sing this last song, just like always, it's a stomper and a clapper. You guys know this song, so let's make some noise uh, to the Lord and sing it together. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Who breaks? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in our and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing Chaos back into order. Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of Glory, the King of Glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun. Yeah. 
Thanks for joining us for Five Oaks at Home. We are so glad that we can continue to connect with one another like this. Our prayer for you during this time, wherever you're at, is that you would find the strength and love of Christ together with us. And as a church family, we can rejoice in that together. I'm gonna invite you to hold your hands in a posture of receiving as I give you the benediction from Hebrews chapter 12. Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaking, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Go and be the church. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>